and welcome to module six of our series about playing association croquet. I've called this module Picking It Up. In the last module we looked at how a break can be constructed and I left uh, a clip on the rover hoop. When you come onto the lawn playing the next turn you're going to have to cope with whatever your opponent has left you. Sometimes you might be fortunate and the opponent has muffed a hoop and just had to go off the lawn, sometimes you can be left with quite a difficult leave as we saw in the last module. So in this module my brother George is going to be picking up the detritus that I have left uh, and then I'm also going to show you one or two other things where you can build uh, a brake and these include cannons and peels. At the end of module 5 brother Ian took his blue ball round to hoop 11 and uh, left me with my red ball here beside hoop 2 and my yellow ball over there in, in uh, corner 3. So I now have to decide which ball I'm going to play and generally speaking when you walk onto the lawn to begin your turn look at the disposition of the balls and obviously first of all if you've got balls which are close together, one of your balls is close to another ball, either an enemy ball or your own ball, play that one for preference. Otherwise, play the ball that's of most use to your opponent. Now this red ball is close to hoop two, so Ian could use it as his hoop two pioneer uh, if he manages to get the black ball through hoop one. So I think this is the ball to play. And the thing to do then is to shoot at the nearest ball, which is my partner ball, the yellow, which is over uh, on the other side of the lawn beside uh, corner three. So I missed. So my red ball comes back onto the yard line. Now, if I had no bisques, it would be Ian's turn to play and he's quite nicely lined up for hoop one. But I have the odd bisque up my sleeve, so I'm going to take a bisque and I'm going to play my yellow ball. I think I'm going to hit it quite hard and get it back across to hoop two as a hoop two pioneer. Well, it didn't go all that far. Actually, it's not a bad hoop three pioneer as things have turned out. So I'm going to leave it here and do a thin takeoff and go down for the black ball because that's closer to the east boundary. And then I'll get behind the blue ball and try and rush that across to hoop one, which is my first hoop. So this is just a thin takeoff aiming to go to the black ball. Just making sure that those are touching. So here we are, down by hoop four. I could have done with being another couple of yards further on, but never mind. Now I'm going to play the black, and the temptation is to hit it, to, to play it quite slowly. The difficulty with that is that when um, you play a ball slowly, it's much more subject to the vagaries of the lawn. Little dimples, hills, weeds, whatever. So you need to play these shots reasonably firmly. Not too hard, but just try and keep the, the red ball in a straight line. So I just nicked the black which is fine, I didn't want it to go too far and remember what we said about getting balls into the lawn and off the boundary. I'm going to play a little stop shot here, putting black more or less in front of hoop four and it would be potentially a nice hoop four pioneer and putting my red ball about here so I can rush the blue across to hoop one. So that's a nice little rush. When, 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 when balls are very close to going in a rush they're sometimes called a dolly rush. This is not quite a dolly rush but it's not far off. So this is quite an easy 
straight rush across to hoop one. So my blue ball has rushed over here. I might have liked it to have been on the live side of the hoop, but never mind. I'm going to do a split shot. And as usual, the ball sails through the hoop with no bother. Pick up my red clip. And now I need to play the blue again as my reception ball. So I managed to uh, just nick the blue down here. Now, my problem is I don't have a Hoop 2 Pioneer. I've got a, a black beside Hoop 4 and I've got a, a yellow beside Hoop 3, nothing beside Hoop 2. So I need to, to manufacture a Hoop 2 Pioneer. And the way I'm going to do this is to put the blue up towards Hoop 3, at the same time going to black, then rush black down towards Hoop 3 as well, and then get onto the yellow ball to make the yellow my Hoop 2 Pioneer, like this. And again, try not to leave balls behind. Take the balls with you as you're going round. So this is a, a split roll. I'm going across towards the black. My Red ball has ended here, a couple of feet from the black. Very easy little roquet. And now I'm going to do a roll to take both balls down to hoop three and hopefully get my um, red ball in a position to, hoop, to rush the yellow across to hoop two. I could, of course, do a takeoff and leave the black here, but then I'd be without a hoop three pioneer. So I need to uh, get them both down there and take it from there. So this is going to be a pass roll, dead straight down the lawn. So that pass roll has given me um, a reasonable Hoop 3 Pioneer, quite a good Pioneer really and I'm nicely lined up on the yellow to rush it across to hoop two. So here we are at hoop two, um, quite nicely placed now, and this is just exactly as we've seen in previous uh, modules, a little Dinky. And through the hoop. And so on. And we've got a nice four ball break set up now with a pioneer at hoop three. We've got a pivot in the middle of the lawn and I could go around from here quite simply, all for spending one bisque. And it, took a, it takes a little bit of skill and practice, but not that much. Do you remember at the end of Module 1, Brother Ian showed uh, the um, elements of a four-ball break, and then he stuck with his blue in hoop five here. So now I'm coming onto the lawn as the opposition player, and I have to decide which of my balls I'm going to play, red or yellow. I could play either of them, and uh, it's a question from here really of deciding which one is going to give me the best break building opportunity. I could from here the black and try and roll them across to hoop one. That would be very dodgy indeed. What I'm going to do is to play the red and hit the yellow and then try and put the yellow into a position as a 
possible pioneer for hoop two and then the same shot get down to the black. I'm going to leave the blue alone for the moment. It's stuck on the hoop and it's tricky to try and dig it out from this position. So I'm playing the red and intending to hit the yellow. Yellow's come to here and from here I can split shot it, yellow going across towards hoop two and the red going back up the lawn towards the black. And so this is going to be actually a thick takeoff. So I'm actually aiming more or less at hoop one. Now that shot has actually been a bit of good fortune. I'd really been hoping to get the red to there so that I could rush the black across to hoop one. But it's come to the live side of hoop five and I can clearly see the blue ball. So I'm going to dig the blue ball out from here, which will give me a nice easy shot to get behind the black. Well, not a lot of digging there, but I can still take croquet off it. It's a quite a narrow angle and get behind the black. So I'm now in a position with the red to rush the black across to hoop one. I'm just going to do a little take off here. I don't particularly want to have the, the black ball straight in front of the hoop, which is what would happen if I did a split shot. So this is a very gentle, thin take off. Pick up the clip. And rush the black ball away from the hoop. What you don't want in those situations is the hoop getting in, your, in the way of your shot. Get yourself in, into clear space. So from here, I want to put the black ball across to hoop three as my hoop three pioneer and split shot the red across to the yellow, which is handy for hoop two. I'm going to leave the blue ball alone. It's difficult to dig it out from hoop five from this angle. So I'm just going to leave it alone and then it, it will be picked up later on in the break. So this is a simple split roll. So my red has ended quite nicely on the yellow. A very simple row cape. And then, guess what? Here we are on that circle again. And a very simple half drive, half roll, whatever. And bob it through the hoop. So there we are. For spending one bisque, I've now got myself into at least a three ball break situation. Roque the yellow, pop it down to hoop four, pick up the black, back to hoop three and so on. Just as we've seen in other modules. It's really not that difficult, providing you think in advance exactly what you're going to do. Not right now, but perhaps in two or three strokes time. So just get into the habit of thinking ahead and taking your time. There's, there's no need to rush. You don't want to play slowly, but you do need to think. So give yourself thinking time and, uh, and work out the best possible advantage to yourself and the worst possible advantage 
to your opponent. A very powerful way of picking up a break is to use what's known as a cannon. And a cannon is a single shot which is both a croquet shot and a rush built into the same shot. Now let me show you what I mean. Here my opponent has shot at a, uh, a corner ball, the corner ball is the yellow, and is shot with the red and missed. So the, the red has come back onto the yard line here. I've managed to get my black ball here by taking off from my blue partner ball somewhere else on the lawn. And now I'm going to roquet the red and I'm going to put it into the corner area here. So you'll remember from our earlier modules that when a ball goes off in the corner and there's already a corner ball here, it can go on the yard line either there or there. And I'm going to put it here. I roquet the red, so I have to take croquet off the red ball, which I put on the yard line here. And because the red is touching the yellow, I can move the yellow ball anywhere I like around the red as long as it's not touching the striker's ball. So the yellow ball can go anywhere I like. There are various sorts of cannon and what I think is the feeblest is one called the worm and I'll show you why it's feeble in a moment. So here I am taking croquet off the red ball and the yellow ball is going to move. So the, the yellow and the black are in a line with the red slightly to one side. So this is the worm cannon. So I can now rush the yellow up towards the hoop. And with my croquet shot, approach the hoop and then just bob the ball through with the continuation shot. And that's all very well. Okay, I've made a hoop, but look where the, uh, the balls are. My red is still on the west boundary. It's pre pretty useless, frankly. And I've got a, I haven't even got a forward rush as it happens. So the worm is okay, but it's not a good cannon. Let's have a look at a better example. So here we are, back as we started, taking croquet off the red ball and the yellow is the corner ball. So I'm taking croquet off this ball. Now in this cannon, this is called a half crown cannon. Um, before decimal currency, uh, one of our largest coins was a half crown, which was about that much in diameter, rather larger than a 50 pence piece. And in this uh, cannon, you can move the yellow ball around, of course. Now the thing is that, as we said before, the yellow ball can be anywhere, but it must not touch the black. And in this cannon, we're trying to get the red ball, our croquet ball, up towards hoop two so that we can run hoop one off the yellow ball with the rush. So I'm pointing uh, the red at hoop two down the line of centers. The gap between the black striker's ball and the yellow is about that much which is the diameter of an old half crown coin. And I'm going to play this shot aiming the mallet at about hoop six. So in this situation, the red has ended up as a very nice Hoop 2 Pioneer, which we'll show you in a moment. And the black has rushed the yellow nicely in front of the hoop. So I simply pick up the black, put it into a croquet position.
and Bob's your uncle, we've got a, at least a three ball break already built up for us by one shot, the cannon. So here is my red ball, as you can see it's uh, no more than four yards from hoop two. A, a lovely position from which to start and build a break. Not all cannons need to be on the corner. A cannon can be anywhere, can be in the middle of the lawn, wherever, but the corners are the easiest because you have a, a, a ball with a very large area of uh, a, a boundary behind it in which you can rush your other ball. Now here's another example. We're up towards corner two and my opponent balls again are quite close together but on the yard line this time and I can manufacture a cannon here by rocaying the yellow quite gently so that when it comes back onto the yard line it will be touching the red ball. Now as you can see my mallet is actually it's spot on the red ball so in this situation it's up to me the striker as to whether my yellow ball, the croquet ball, goes either this side or that side of the yard line ball which is already there. Now we're actually going for hoop one back here, hoop seven in golf croquet terms, so it's just here. Here's hoop one back and I'm taking croquet off the yellow so I can move the red around the yellow anywhere I like. And the basic rule with cannons is that the croquet ball, the yellow in this case, goes to the next hoop but one, in other words two back, and the rushed ball goes to the immediate hoop, in other words one back here. So I need to move the balls around, I want the yellow to go in that direction and the red to come down here. So when I've run the hoop I'll be able to play the yellow again of course. And this time I'm aiming roughly at the peg. So now I can pick up my black ball. I rush the red to here so I'm now playing the croquet shot on the red. So from here of course I can simply run the hoop. And then pick up the other balls, I've actually got a, my blue ball is down beside uh, two back so I'm quite nicely placed to carry on the break. In those examples of cannons which were quite straightforward, we just looked at two or three there are actually lots of cannons that you can use depending on where you are and which balls you have to work with. Uh, most of the good textbooks show you how to use cannons well, but the important thing with cannons is to practice them. They're not as easy as they look and just getting the angles quite right is quite tricky. So you need to practice cannons frequently. They probably won't crop up in a game frequently, but when they do they're a really, really powerful way of making a break start and then carrying it on when uh, all seemed lost. One of the other facets of association croquet that you need to be aware of are what are known as peels. A peel is when you put a ball through a hoop using another ball as the engine as it were. And they're called peels after Walter Peel who was uh, one of the early all England champions in the 1860s and actually it's Walter Peel that we have to thank for the creation of the Croquet Association in uh, 1897. He managed to knock a number of Victorian heads together, um, warring heads, and got them to agree to form the single united All England Croquet Association. And Walter Peel was adept at um, putting balls through a hoop with another ball and so the, 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 the tactic or the skill became known as a peel. And it's very simple really. Here we have a, a, a blue ball in front of a hoop and if you remember from uh, module 5 I got the blue round to within, uh, 
one hoop of finishing and this is what's known as a rover peel. Now we've got to assume for the moment that these balls have got here by magic. We'll have a look at how they got here um, next time but all you do is to roque the, the peely as it's called and then very carefully line these balls up and what I'm going to hit, do is to hit the black ball so that the blue ball will run through the hoop and then the black ball will go through in the continuation stroke and y you'll see in the croquet literature photographs of eminent croquet players lying down on the ground lining their balls up and the way to do it is to with the uh, near side uh, wire line the balls up so that the edges of the balls just miss that wire. Now personally I don't often like crawling around on lawns particularly if they're wet which is not a pleasant experience so I tend to do it by squatting down and looking at the peaks of the balls where there are crescent shapes and that's nearly as good and it saves getting your knees wet. I don't like having my trousers wet. So this is a stop shot. Oh, it pushed it through and now on the continuation stroke I can run the hoop. Now practice in handicap croquet peels are not that important and it's also important not to be tricked as it were into doing a peel in an inappropriate place. You can sometimes find your balls lined up in front of a hoop oh I can peel that hoop without thinking about what comes next. Let's have a little look at an example of that. Here is a tempting situation. Um, Blue is my hoop four pioneer, here is hoop four, and black is also for hoop four. And uh, it would be very tempting to do this. Okay, two for the price of one. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that I've actually sacrificed the chance of a decent break. Look at where my opponent balls are. The yellow is somewhere over by west boundary and the red is over by uh, hoop two or one back. Let's replay the action. So here we are back in front of hoop four and instead of peeling it, I'm going to just okay the blue gently and then do the normal thing come through the hoop now I have a rushable ball which I can rush actually to either of the opponent balls pick them up and carry on the break there is a saying in croquet never forego a break for the sake of appeal. Appeal may win you one hoop, a break win you the game. Thank you for watching this module, module six, where we've tried to show you one or two things to bear in mind when you're picking up and starting a break from scratch and some of the techniques that you can use in to, to help you do that. Please join me next time for module seven, when we're going to be looking at errors faults and wiring.